what we're here to talk about today. Because a cure for MS is multifaceted. It takes a global effort to fund the most promising research to drive progress toward a cure. And it takes diligent work to make sure that everyone living with MS can access that progress to live their best lives. I'm very thankful for the role that the National MS Society is playing to help make this common goal a reality. And for the support that they have provided me on my MS journey. 30 years ago, I had a high-powered career in television news. One day I was giving a presentation when the whole right side of my body went numb. I thought maybe I was having a stroke. I had never heard the words multiple sclerosis from my doctors, despite many issues, which in hindsight were probably early signs of MS. My boss told me to take the day off, but I ended up taking the rest of my career off. That was the beginning of my MS journey, and it was really a struggle. It was devastating to have to walk away from a career that I loved. I had two little children, starting a divorce, and having a very difficult time financially. I had to completely revise and redefine my life. And this was 30 years ago before there were any disease-modifying drugs available. When I was finally able to begin my first MS drug, that helped. But what helped me most was the National MS Society. I went from knowing absolutely nothing about this disease to having a place where I could fill in the blanks and connect with people who understood what I was going through. The society changed my life. I've made enormous progress from those early days, and I'm able to live a healthy life and do things that are very important to me, like volunteering at my children's school. And as my situation changed, I knew that I wanted to find a way to give back to the organization that has done so much for me. I saw the progress being made, and I decided that now is the time to give, to get us closer to the finish line, which is a cure for everyone. And, and that's why I decided to become a lead investor in the Society's Pathways to Cure initiative. Uh, it's the biggest, most collaborative MS research effort of our time. And by bringing together MS organizations across the globe to collaborate, the Society is making it possible to close in faster on a cure. And I'm honored to join the other lead investors in giving this groundbreaking initiative the jumpstart that it needs. We're about to learn more about Pathways to Cures and hear directly from some of the bright minds in MS research who are working every day to bring us closer to that cure. Cures for MS are closer than ever. That means no new lesions. That means being closer to doing the things you love without limits. Closer to never again hearing a doctor say, you, you have, have MS. MS. Through Pathways to Cures, we're closer than ever to stopping MS in its tracks. Restoring lost function and ending MS forever. And we're getting there the way we have for every MS breakthrough. Together. Together. We're going bigger and bolder than ever before. No matter your connection to the MS movement, we need you to help close in on the cures for MS. Because there won't be a one-size-fits-all approach to a cure. Among the 2.8 million people living with MS globally, every symptom, every progression, every experience is unique. We invite you to join us on the Pathways to Cures. Cures will change lives. Cures will make sure that the next chapter for MS is the last.
My name is Kamisi and Harrison, and I am a Sylvia Lowry Fellow funded by the Society. My introduction to MS came when I was just a teenager and my mother was diagnosed. I had always been interested in science and seeing her experience with the ebbs and flows of the disease, as well as the ways this disease was so variable from person to person, made me interested in researching more about MS. Further along in my career, I became more interested in learning about the nervous system and seeing patients with MS. I get a sense of fulfillment in seeing those patients and being able to help. While we wait for a cure, my research is focused on enriching the lives of those living with MS as much as I possibly can. Unfortunately, there is a disparity in the health outcomes of people living with MS based on their race. Black adults with MS experience advanced disease progression and worse overall health outcomes compared to white adults, and the reason why is unclear. Some of the research I've been involved in is aimed to fill this gap by exploring the differences in racial and social factors amongst people living with MS. And we're also examining their effects on their healthcare experience. From one study, we found that black people reported more medical mistrust than white people, and black adults living in socioeconomically advantaged areas still reported more discrimination by their healthcare providers with significant effects. All of this to say that even without socioeconomic barriers, racial factors still lead to medical mistrust, which is a barrier to healthcare for minority groups, and this needs further attention. In order to bring new treatments to everyone living with MS and stop disease progression in its tracks, we need representation amongst our clinical trial participants. We need more research like the CHIMES trial that I'm involved in that's studying the effects of ocrelizumab specifically in minorities living with MS. And in order to encourage participation in this research, we need to create trust amongst all populations living with MS. My hope is that my research can change the way doctors interact with their patients, building a relationship where patients feel heard, and that their experience is real, and that we can have more representation among our studies so that we can empower everyone living with MS to live their best lives. Thank you. So my name is Noeli Rivera Torres. I'm a Paige McCoy. Is her name or you? And my pronouns are they, them, them. I am non-binary and I do believe I've always been non-binary, but um, it wasn't until recently that I had the vocabulary to like put to like how I kind of developed as a person. I am a burlesque and drag performer in Philly. A cure to me would be like we not having these weird spots in my vision and being able to see clearly. Not feeling so unstable to where like I need to like always make sure that there's something close by. A cure would be freeing for me because I'd be able to like plan for my future again and actually feel optimistic that I can actually do more things to achieve my goals. My name is Ashley Beecham and I'm a society funded research fellow. I began my career as a biostatistician analyzing gen the genetics of multiple sclerosis. As I became more involved in MS genetics research, I became acutely aware of the work that was still needed to find a cure. I realized that in order to better contribute, there was more I needed to learn. So I went back to school and I got my PhD with a focus on human genetics. While we don't all come into this field with a connection to MS, they certainly develop over time. I live in Miami where the community is very diverse and I see directly how MS affects the Hispanic and black communities. I've come to know three different people living with MS in my church community through conversations about what I do for work. And I see firsthand how the disease affects each person differently with different symptoms and progression. I've also heard the questions they have and I am motivated by the answers that I'm simply unable to provide because there are things that we do not yet understand. We know that genetics plays a role in the development of MS, but what we are still learning is what variants influence disease onset and how. In addition, black and Hispanic people are underrepresented in genetic research of MS despite having similar disease prevalence to Europeans. My research is focused on identifying genetic variants that predispose people to get MS. This will help us to understand what mechanisms and pathways cause MS. 
Genomics can help us identify people with an increased risk of MS so they can get on a proactive therapy to prevent neurological damage before onset of clinical symptoms occurs. What we have learned so far is encouraging. The structure of the genome is different in different racial groups, and we have learned that DNA segments are typically shorter in black and Hispanic people than they are in people of European descent. This helps us narrow in more on the genetic sequences that contribute to MS across populations. We have identified several novel MS risk variants which may be specific to certain groups, and we have used these differences in structure to identify causal variants which may contribute to disease risk for all people. Our research is a constant reminder that the field has not focused on black and Hispanic communities, and we still have so much to learn. Um, the more we include those who have previously not been included, the more we can learn to help every person living with MS. So my name is Noeli Rivera Torres. I'm a physician specializing in neurology. Next year, I'll do my subspecialty in multiple sclerosis and related neuroimmune um, disorders. My mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So my mom is a champion. Uh, I think by herself, she knows that a diagnosis is not gonna stop her. For her and for us, it's really important the family and friends support. You know, my mom has some of the symptoms that we typically don't associate with disability or disease, which are more of the cognitive symptoms. A cure for MS means relief to me and for my patients, and especially for my mom. Um, it means a better guarantee of a better quality of life. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brett Fling. I'm a Harry Weaver Research Fellow funded by the Society and I direct the Sensory Motor Neuroimaging Laboratory at Colorado State University. Uh, like Misty, my experience with MS started when I was a teenager. I was just 13 when my mom was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS and only a year later my aunt, uh, her sister, was diagnosed with primary progressive MS. Uh, my mom has been able to manage her symptoms through disease-modifying therapies, but my aunt's MS progressed rapidly, and we unfortunately lost her just over two years ago. Uh, you know, I remember wondering how two people with the same disease could have such radically different experiences. Uh, right now, my mom is still doing quite well and is able to participate in her daily neighborhood walking club. Uh, in our work in the sensory motor neuroimaging lab, we're helping people living with MS, like my mom, walk more functionally through improvements in their gait and walking performance. We have a lot of really fancy, uh, in other words, very expensive, uh, equipment in our lab. These are things like split belt treadmills, force platforms, and wireless inertial measuring units. And I'll come back to these uh, in a moment. Uh, but that doesn't always translate into helping people in their everyday lives where they don't have access to that fancy equipment. So when people come into our lab for a four or a six week program, we can see significant improvements in their mobility which is great, but it's discouraging if that progress doesn't last. So this is something that we're focused on. If we wanna make people more functional, more independent, and improve their quality of life, we have to do more than just be able to get them into our laboratory for a brief period of time. So wearable technologies, uh, like these wireless inertial measuring units, uh, you can think of maybe a more sophisticated Apple Watch or a Fitbit that a lot of you might have on right now, uh, bring the benefits of this fancy lab technology into people's everyday lives. We've been pairing wearable, functional electrical stimulation during our in-lab sessions together with our more cumbersome lab-based equipment. People are then able to take these wearable sensors home to see if we can elicit long-lasting impacts in their mobility. Uh, our recent work suggests that people with MS are just as capable as those without MS at adapting and improving both their balance control and their walking performance while they're in that laboratory setting. And now we're starting to see promising results that we're able to translate those improvements into daily life by providing portable, wearable stimulation to muscles and nerves in their legs while folks go about their normal daily routine. That was great. It's heartening to, to hear about all of these passionate and 
talented people who have dedicated their careers to finding cures. And there are so many more researchers that we didn't hear from today who are working hard. It means so much. As, as we heard, the cutting edge work in the lab can only change lives when we can bring that progress home. Unfortunately, as some of you may have experienced, all of us don't have the same access to these advances. Whether it's geographic barriers, financial ones, or systemic disparities in our healthcare system, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that that amazing day when the cure finally comes, every single person living with MS can take advantage of it. So it's important to talk about how to bring these cures into our lives. Project ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system, from university medical centers and other specialty care sites, to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists. They learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO, changing the world fast. Join us at echo.unm.edu. Are you part of the ECHO? Hello, my name is Salim Shaheen. I'm an MS neurologist, researcher, and director of the ECHO MS Central Hub. It's exciting to hear from just a few of the many talented MS researchers and clinicians who are doing such incredible work. Still early in their career, just think about the promise of what will come of all their hard work in the years ahead. You know, about 10 years ago, I too attended a National MS Society event much like this one as part of the Tykeson Fellows Conference. The speaker acknowledged all of the clinical and research fellows at the event. I remember looking around at my peers as we took in that moment. We were so proud to be starting our careers in MS. But even back then, I remember feeling that there simply aren't enough of us. MS is remarkably complex and unique to each person. For clinicians, Providing the best possible care requires a depth of knowledge, or at least access to a depth of knowledge. But the reality is, many people with MS simply don't have the option to see an MS specialist. Many of us are working towards bridging the gap and ensuring that every MS patient, no matter where they live, have access to quality MS care. With the society's support, Project ECHO MS launched in 2020. ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Through ECHO MS, we've been able to create a pipeline of MS knowledge that general neurologists and healthcare providers across all disciplines can tap into. Through short, informative sessions and real patient presentations, ECHO MS is reimagining MS knowledge delivery and establishing new and exciting connections between generalists and specialists. Imagine a general neurologist in a rural area who encounters a complicated and challenging case. ECHO MS allows them to present it through this national virtual case conference, both benefiting themselves and others. It's about bringing the specialist down the virtual hall from the generalist. It's about getting those providers plugged into the network, and most importantly, it's about making sure all the incredible work of MS researchers 
like the ones you met today, is getting out into the world. Some of the Central Hub participants are now returning to their third year of ECHO MS. I have witnessed firsthand how this program has impacted their practice. They are more confident and better equipped to treat even the complicated patients. And most importantly, they have made lifetime connections with myself and others in the network. Before I go, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for everything you do. I am lucky that I've been able to dedicate my career to something I am deeply passionate about. And my career would not be possible without all of you. National MS Society funding has been critical as I've made my way through the MS field. Whatever you're doing to keep the MS movement moving forward, I thank you. My name is Crescent Greenwood Campbell. I am a psychotherapist in the state of Pennsylvania and Connecticut. I am a wife, I am a mom, and I am an MS warrior. A cure for MS would look like, it would look like heaven. It would look like perfection. It would look like more days that I can get out of the bed and not be in pain. It would look like more yeses and less noes. A cure for MS would look like less apprehension and more, um, more ability to just be, to be vulnerable, to be more spontaneous. A cure for MS looks like more spontaneity in my life. I don't have to plan out, is it gonna be hot? Is it gonna be cold? Do I need this medication? Do I need that medication? Do I need to layer up? Do I not need to layer up? A cure for MS looks like freedom, ultimate freedom. My name's John Moeller, and I've been living with primary progressive MS for 35 years. My opa, my grandfather, used a wheelchair due, too, due to a mysterious illness that he was told was post-polio. Philip Moeller was a smart and cheerful man, but you could count on one hand the number of times that he left his apartment in the 1970s. It was almost 20 years later that I was an inpatient at Chicago Rush for my first mega dose of IV solumedrol. The nurse pointed to the TV news program and President Bush, the father, was signing some papers that were called the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is going to be important, she said. Little did I know. I was able to get out of my home better than my opa but still I felt cut out of the rhythm of life, out of opportunities, and out of the hundreds of small interactions that you have in the course of a week. And over the years and decades, that isolation eroded my spirit, like the MS eroded my myelin. But then came the pandemic, and an ironic thing happened. As the world locked down, it drew in on itself. My world bloomed with possibilities because remote connectivity was coming into its own. And I was able to Zoom communications with more people than I ever had before. And today, my life is a full one. Not surprisingly, I'm passionate about outreach and access. I, I want to relay the important work that all of you here are doing about I want to extend support, self-advocacy skills, coping techniques, and an attitude that you can live and thrive with MS. And that's why I'm proud to help build the MS Connections Group on The Mighty, which is a growing social media platform connecting those affected by MS. And another more established program, launched by a Texan, the late Susan Zachary is MS Friends, which arranges peer-to-peer -peer phone conversations between primarily newly diagnosed people and volunteers who are living with MS. These platforms reach people where they are, people like my OPA, so that no one with MS feels like they're alone. 
I, I wish Myopa had programs like this available to him. So I thank the MS Society for its outreach programs like this and for its support of volunteers like me who have a lot to offer. I, I'm an example I think of that the right supports can help someone like me find their footing. And finally, I ask that you direct any applause to the person who inspires me, and that's my wonderful wife and caregiver, Mary Ann. Thank you. I couldn't be here without her. And please continue that applause. Please continue that applause for the 53 million Mary Anns and Omas who are working quietly and diligently on, this, on the view of the public. This is National Family Caregivers Month, and their numbers are only growing. So please, MS Society, support them robustly. Thank you very much, everybody. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go, go. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for you. everything that you're doing, John. Thank you. And we, we really appreciate your helping facilitate important connections that help people like us share stories and that'll make our lives better and everyone's. So thank you. We're in a pivotal moment in the history of MS. And that's why I chose to support this exciting Pathways to Cures initiative and the National MS Society. They're leading the way to not only fund the research that will discover the cures, but work every day to make sure that those cures can make a difference in the lives of the nearly one million people who live with MS in the United States. It's exciting to see this progress happen in real time. It gives me hope, not just for myself, but for everyone who is affected by MS now and who might be in the future. The next chapter could be the last chapter for MS. I've seen firsthand how the society can change people's lives. This important work can't wait. We have to keep pushing forward for you, for me, for everyone. The time is now. Um, my name is Emily, and I live with MS. On a good day, I am walking fine. I can do just about everything I want to do. My dad's doing pretty well. He's still walking, he still works full time. With my new infusion, I am having more better days than bad days. My knees feel good. I can actually feel all 10 of my toes. I haven't had any symptoms or episodes in a long time. I think the rate at which we're finding discoveries in MS is pretty astounding. A generation or two ago, people had no treatment options to turn to. The medications have really changed the course. When Jean was diagnosed, she had been uh, an avid cyclist, uh, biking 40 miles every single morning. People call me Dash. That's my nickname, because how I move rather quickly. Altogether, I served for about 12 years, from 1991 to 2003. Married to the person of my dreams, feeling really stable. And then everything just got ripped out. couple of years of her diagnosis, she was wheelchair bound, and just a few years later, she was uh, bed bound quadriplegic. The doctors told me they weren't sure if I'd be able to walk without a walker or walk anymore. I couldn't run. It would just mess with me in my mind, like Dash couldn't run. My mom also had MS. I can 
only hope that um, when it comes to my MS, that it does not impact me as much as it did her. You cry because um, you mourn your former self. I'm thinking about my body holding up every day for the rest of my life. And that's, that sucks. That really sucks. But we're resilient. We always have been. All these drugs that we have to slow down the progression of the disease is great, but what I would like to see in my lifetime is an actual cure. We've really come far away in such a short amount of time. If we continue doing what we're doing, raising more money, supporting more research, we will find a cure. Talk to us, reach out to us, listen, because the only way we can find a cure is with help from everybody. We have to go on offense. We have to change the course of this. And I don't think that's a lot to ask. There's a lot more than we can do. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention, and I want to thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks so much for thank listening. Thank you for listening.